Howdy. Howdy. My name is Jonathan Chen, president of the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management student chapter here at Texas A&M University. I'd like to welcome y'all to this afternoon's panel discussion on 21st century deterrence and the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. This event is co-sponsored by INSER, the Institute for National Security and Cybersecurity Education and Research, NISPE, the Center for National uh, Nuclear Security Science and Policy Initiatives, and the Bush School of Government and Public Service. Without the support, this event would not have been possible. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that photos and recordings of this event will be taken and electronically distributed afterwards. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Marvin Adams, who will be the moderator of this panel. Dr. Adams is an HGRI professor at the Department of Nuclear Engineering here at Texas A&M University. He is also the Associate Director of NSERC. Without further ado, Dr. Adams. Well, I can't tell you how happy I am to, to have this fine group of panelists here to, to speak with you. Um, naturally, I've heard all of them talk before, um, I, so I think carefully. I think you'll be impressed. Um, a little bit about the ground rules. I've asked them to hold their opening remarks to about 10 minutes each. The idea then, if, if, if I'm able to restrain them to 10 minutes each, then we will have an ample time for Q&A afterward. I don't want this to be one of those panel discussions where the moderator uh, talks all the time and you don't get a chance to ask your questions. So we're going to have a lot of time for Q&A at the end, I promise. And if you don't ask questions, then we'll just talk to each other, ask each other questions and stuff. But I would really prefer that you ask what's on your mind, and I suspect you'll have some to ask. I had a one-slide um, opening view graph to show you. It was uh, just to kind of set the stage and remind us all how we got to where we are today. And it started with the discovery of fission, which um, is remarkably recent. Remarkably recent. In 1939, the first paper came out on fission. And a few years later, 1942, Fermi had a reactor critical. I will remark that we can't do an environmental impact statement that quickly today. But he had his reactor running in December of 42. And the first nuclear weapons exploded in 1945. Things were happening quickly then. Um, you, you know a lot of the history. Um, I would have pointed out a few things on the timeline. If anyone's interested, I took the trouble to make it so I can send it out to you. There have been lots of uh, countries that have tested nuclear weapons, some small, some large nuclear weapons explosions. Everybody knows uh, there is one country that continues to test, it's North Korea. Everybody knows probably that we've had a series of treaties. We've had test moratoria. We've had... Um, limited test ban treaty where we all, most of us anyway, agreed not to test in the atmosphere anymore. Then we had threshold test ban treaty where we agreed that we wouldn't exceed 150 kilotons. We had arms limitation treaties, SALT 1, SALT 2, SORT, START, New START, uh, the INF, all these things are important. The, the uh, NPT, the big deal, the non-proliferation regime, the whole thing we've set up. So um, I hope most of you are familiar with at least some of that. Uh, it is. It does provide the, the background here. The order in which we're going to have our speakers enlighten us, um, we're going to start with Dr. Castillo from the Bush School. He's going to talk about deterrence in the 21st century. And I think he'll probably tell us that it's a little different now than it was in the 1960s. We're going to have Dr. Furman from Political Science talk to us about nonproliferation. And that sets the stage then for uh, Ms. Rebecca Hurstman to talk to us about the recently released U.S. Nuclear Posture Review, which sets the policy for our nuclear weapons for the coming years. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Bob Webster who runs the weapons program at Los Alamos, give us uh, some remarks on the challenges of maintaining a deterrent in the 21st century without nuclear testing. So that's, that's the game plan. I am going to 
let them talk, except I am going to be brutal about the time limit. I'm not going to take a lot of time to introduce each of them. Uh, I've already told you the order we're going to go in, and I will ask each of them to take a few seconds at the beginning of, of his or her 10 minutes to introduce themselves. So, with that, let's welcome Dr. Castillo and the other panel members. So I'm a political scientist by training, and I tainted myself by uh, working in government for a while. And, uh, it's made it hard on the job market. But here I am at the Bush School, where I can talk about policy and inflate threats. And uh, today I want to talk about what the strategic deterrence environment looks like. And uh, I want to focus on what I see as one specific challenge uh, that worry people uh, in the Department of Defense, and I think is at the core of the nuclear posture review. Uh, and that is the problem of uh, the con a conventional fight against a nuclear armed power. Uh, in 1995, Barry Posen wrote a much overlooked piece in security studies entitled, What If Saddam Hussein Had Had Nuclear Weapons? And he tried to focus the mind on having to do the Gulf War over again uh, against a nuclear armed uh, Saddam Hussein, a nuclear armed adversary. And I think if you look out in the strategic landscape today, there are plenty of places where we might encounter and have a disagreement with a nuclear armed power. So I want to make three different points. I want to say first, this is not a new problem. Uh, the Cold War was about uh, extended deterrence and using nuclear weapons to offset uh, conventional advantages. Uh, I want to talk about how we face the Cold War problem today, but it's in reverse. Uh, I'm going to make you wish you were back in the Cold War. And then third, I'm going to talk about solutions to that problem and why they're all bad and why deep down inside I'm an isolationist. So uh, the first problem is, the first way to think about this is that uh, a lot of people read the Nuclear Posture Review and they kind of ripped their hair out and uh, set their house on fire and they were afraid and upset because these arguments seemed very strange and out of place, but my reaction to the Nuclear Posture Review is that we've always been thinking about nuclear weapons in this way. This is not new. We had a brief hiatus when President Obama had the Prague speech. Remember, President Obama did his very kind of a Jimmy Carter impression and came in wanting nuclear disarmament and left with a nuclear modernization program that the nuclear enterprise is overworked by but very happy about. So. Um, the question is, why, why are people having the reaction to the nuclear posture review in this way? And I think it's because we got into the mindset that the world had changed at the end of the Cold War, that nuclear weapons were a Cold War thing, and that they're going to fade into the background and we're all going to go to zero. So what, how did we use nuclear weapons during the Cold War? Well, what we did is we offset the Soviet conventional advantage. We used it as the, the linchpin of our extended deterrence umbrella, hence the nuclear umbrella, to protect Western Europe. Remember, it was the Red Army that defeated Nazi Germany, right? So at the end of World War II, we had to protect Western Europe. We're not Athens, right? We're, we're, we're Athens, we're not Sparta, so we weren't going to garrison Western Europe with a large conventional force, so we relied on nuclear weapons to do that. And that problem became increasingly more difficult as our nuclear monopoly was broken, as our nuclear superiority was challenged, and as the Soviet Union caught up and we lived in the condition of mutual vulnerability or mutually assured destruction. So we spent the Cold War developing different strategies where we could convince the Soviet Union that in a conventional war for the survival of Western Europe, we had strategies for using nuclear weapons first in an incredible way. The good news is we never tested those theories. The Cold War ended, and we ended a period where we thought history had ended, that we were having a unipolar moment, that we had experienced a conventional revolution in military affairs. We began toppling regimes in the Middle East, right? Asked Saddam Hussein about our conventional military prowess. So we've come out of the Cold War. We think nuclear weapons are floating into the background, and we have conventional military dominance. That brings us to my second point, which is we face the Cold War problem in reverse. So what do I mean by that? Well, if in the Cold War we saw nuclear weapons as a way to offset the advantages of the Red Army in Europe. Remember, that was a home game for them and a away game for us. The Red Army was very large. Today, the problem we face is that everyone understands that we are conventionally superior in most situations. I don't want to overstate the case. 
But our adversaries, whether it's North Korea, China, Russia, they have work, been working to improve the survivability of their nuclear forces. Their modernization is to improve, to make sure that we can't use our conventional forces to disarm them. And they've been working in ways to think about using their nuclear forces to offset our conventional advantages. And one of the problems where you can see this scenario, where they see this difficulty in stark relief is uh, my colleagues at the RAND Corporation uh, a few years ago developed a war game about the Baltics, where uh, Russian forces in 72 hours uh, seize one of the Baltic countries, and the United States is put in the position where it has to run the Gulf War, but now in the Baltics. So think about that. You're fighting Russia in its backyard. You have to eject them from the Baltics. And the concern is that if you win, the consolation prize is that Russia is going to use nuclear weapons first. Russia is not going to be like Saddam Hussein. They're not going to roll over. And, and, and the concern is that we may be in a situation where we have to fight to defend our NATO allies that we committed to in the Baltics. And they're going to use nuclear weapons to either deter us from reinvading and liberating the Baltics or using nuclear weapons first. Uh, and we can talk later in the Q&A about what that would look like. But I just want to leave you with why I think this is important. In the Cold War, we were offsetting the Red Army's conventional advantage. Today, others are using nuclear weapons to offset our advantage. And many of the scenarios that worry us, we are fighting in their backyard. In other words, the stakes are asymmetric. They favor the adversary. So that means that adversaries have reasons, because they're in the domains of losses, they're trying to protect something they're about to lose, that they will take more risk. And they'll use nuclear weapons to manipulate that risk. So if that's the strategic problem, if we face the Cold War problem in reverse, what are the solutions to address this problem? They're not very good. <laughs> uh, there are three, and they're straight out of Cold War deterrence theory. We're back? OK, so solutions. Solutions to this problem, which I think that we're facing, that I think that's motivating not all the nuclear posture review, but a significant portion of the nuclear posture review. So three solutions, straight out of the Cold War. The first is. Um, one argument you see out there is this scenario is overblown, that uh, our nuclear weapons and our adversaries' nuclear weapons cancel each other out. No one will pull a nuclear trigger for fear of retaliation on both sides. And as a result, deterrence is actually pretty robust, and we don't have to worry about those scenarios. Uh, I'm not sure that's, that's correct. Uh, and if we find ourselves fighting Russia in that kind of scenario, then deterrence has already failed. and so we have to think about how Russia might react. So what if Russia did use a nuclear weapon in a, in a limited way? What if, what if we are bringing freedom back to Estonia, we're destroying the Russian army, we're kicking it out of Estonia, and the Russians detonate a nuclear weapon over the Baltics, not to kill anyone, but to signal their resolve, signal that they're upset. And they do it during Wolf Blitzer's Situation Room, right? To focus the mind that this war could get out of hand, and is the game worth the candle? How should the United States react? Well, I see two different possible reactions out there in the debate. One is we'll use our damage limitation capability. We have conventional, precise conventional weapons, and we can disarm or defang the Russian nuclear force. Uh, we have a variety of nuclear weapons we can use. And then we have missile defense that can mop up that kind of retaliation. So you can imagine as a civilian planner in the Pentagon, you probably scratch your head and say, What's your second option, right? <laughs> because you might not get all those nuclear weapons in a, in a first strike, and that's going to do. That's going to make all that money I've donated to save the bay kind of irrelevant. Uh, so then, the where we are, and I think where we are in the nuclear posture review is contemplating limited nuclear war, and we need to think about limited nuclear options, right? We need, and and, and the problem is, is when the Cold War ended, we. Get that extra thirty seconds back. <laughs> I already gave it to you. So, problem is, I'm just going to abandon this. The problem is, we've abandoned the middle of the escalation ladder, right? We have options that are at the very high end, and then we have some really interesting, intriguing, and very threatening conventional options. But in that middle of the escalation ladder, tactical nuclear weapons, low yield weapons of a variety of type that we used to have all over Europe, we don't have those anymore. So it's like someone woke up, 
read the Nuclear Posture Review and said, oh my god, we need options in between doing nothing and hitting someone in the head with a hammer. And so that's why I think the Nuclear Posture Review calls for a low-yield submarine-launched ballistic missile and calls for the deployment of a, a new submarine-launched cruise missile. Things that we can use in the contingency to respond to limited use. Now the question that we have to be asking ourselves is do we want to be in the business of fighting limited nuclear wars? Do we want to be in the position where we have to run those risks? And if we do, I think we have to spend a lot of intellectual capital figuring out how to turn these wars off. I have an entire capstone group that is sick of me. And we're, this is a class I teach at the Bush School. And I've asked them to go read the literature on war termination. It's, it's not a happy subject, but there's also not a lot of good ideas out there. So, uh, that's where I think the strategic landscape is today. That we, we face the Cold War problem. Thank you. Hello, thank you all for coming. I'm Matt Herman. I'm a professor in the political science department here at Texas A&M. Uh, I conduct research on various aspects of nuclear weapons and nonproliferation, and I teach classes on nuclear politics, international security, and statistical research methods. I'm going to talk about the nonproliferation regime, and in particular some challenges that we're facing in this regime in the contemporary international environment. To start off, I want to say a few words about a big puzzle in the world of nuclear politics. And that puzzle is this. Only 10 countries have ever built nuclear weapons. And only nine possess them today. That's far fewer than most people would have predicted going back several decades. In the early 1960s, for example, President Kennedy expected that there would be 30 or so countries armed with nuclear weapons by the 1980s. It might seem preposterous to think this now, but back in the 1950s, from declassified documents, we know that there was concerns that countries like Belgium and the Netherlands might seek nuclear weapons. So if you go back several decades, you will find lots of evidence that there were many countries in the world who were interested in at least seeking the technology needed to build nuclear weapons. And 70 years into the nuclear age, only 10 have done it despite the fact that many more could do so if they wanted to. So this is not a problem of technology. It's not a problem of the lack of capacity to do it. It's a political issue. So what explains this puzzle? Why have only 10 countries built nuclear weapons, despite the fact that many more could do so if they so desired? It's a complicated question, and there's not a single answer. I want to highlight two factors that I see as critical in explaining this puzzle. They're not the only two that matter, but, but they're two of the most important, in my opinion. One is the creation of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, or NPT, which opened for signatures in 1968 and entered into force in 1970. What we see following the onset of the creation of the NPT is a decline in the interest in nuclear weapons globally. Why might that be the case? Well, the NPT is based on several bargains. Uh, it requires countries that do not currently possess nuclear weapons to not obtain those weapons. And it also entitles these countries to receive assistance in developing their peaceful nuclear programs for energy or research, and uh, requires the nuclear powers, including the United States, to make good faith efforts towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. One of the things I've looked at in my research is trying to estimate statistically the, the effect that this treaty has had on countries' nonproliferation policies. And what I found in that work is that, in fact, the NPT uh, can account for a significant decline in the number of nuclear weapon states that exist in the world today. That is, if you imagine a counterfactual world where the NPT was not created, or the NPT was created but not as many countries ratified it as had done so, if that counterfactual world is the world we lived in, we would be seeing more nuclear weapon states. So this treaty 
in my view, has played a critical role in not eliminating the spread of nuclear weapons, but in dramatically curtailing the number of countries that have nuclear weapons. The second factor that I want to focus on, which I think is, is equally important, and maybe even more important in some ways, is the alliance architecture that the United States set up after World War II. One reason that at least some countries remain non-nuclear is that they can rely on the United States for their security. You can think, for example, of Japan and South Korea. These are two countries that are under the so-called US nuclear umbrella. They face security threats, but nonetheless have confidence that they can rely on the United States to meet those uh, threats, and therefore they don't need an independent nuclear deterrent in order to address their, their security threats. It turns out that uh, very few countries who have an alliance commitment, a, a defense pact, with a nuclear weapons state, whether the Soviet Union during the Cold War or the United States, uh, very few of those states have gone on to pursue or develop nuclear weapons. There are some obvious exceptions, of course. Great Britain in 1952 requires a nuclear weapons capability despite being a U.S. ally. France does the same in 1960 uh, despite being a U.S. ally. But uh, overall, very few U.S. allies and, and Soviet allies as well during the Cold War have developed nuclear weapons. So, so I see this, this alliance architecture is being really critical in curtailing the spread of nuclear weapons. If the U.S. defense commitment to Japan, say, were to uh, dramatically weaken or go away, I estimate that the probability of a Japanese bomb is going to go way up. It's not going to be 100%, but it's going to significantly increase from where it is right now. Okay, so in light of those uh, two explanations for the puzzle of Nonproliferation. Let me raise a couple of concerns that are emerging in in the contemporary international landscape today. One of those concerns has to do with what's going on in Iran and North Korea. North Korea now uh, possesses nuclear weapons as uh, long-range missiles that can hit portions of the United States. Uh, Iran is. Uh, Part of a, a non-proliferation agreement with the United States right now, known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, but there are concerns that uh, this deal might not uh, be tenable moving forward, and that one or more parties to the agreement might break it. So, in, in light of these things, there are major concerns about future uh, nuclear weapons proliferation. These cases, that is Iran and North Korea, are creating pressures in parts of the world to rethink their nuclear policies. So in South Korea and in Japan, based on what's going on in North Korea, you have some policymakers who are quietly weighing their options and thinking about what they might need to do to address the threats they're facing. In light of uh, what's going on in Iran, you have Arab countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who see themselves as, as strategic adversaries of Iran, thinking about what their nuclear policy might look like moving forward and, and having uh, discussions, some of them openly, about whether they might need to, to seek uh, nuclear weapons capability. So that's one problem, that these pressures are, are creating momentum towards nuclear weapons globally. One thing we know about why nuclear weapons spread is that we have to worry about uh, political chain reactions. That is, if one country goes nuclear, the odds that others are going to go nuclear goes up dramatically. So uh, if Iran gets nuclear weapons, that's bad for a lot of reasons. One of them is that it could trigger other countries in the Middle East to do the same thing. The second problem is that uh, one might argue that uh, in recent months, there's been questions raised about how serious the United States is with respect to defending certain key allies, like, say, Japan. Uh, and this worries me. If you go back to one of the reasons why I think proliferation hasn't occurred at such a rapid pace, as I said, it's the alliance architecture that has restrained proliferation. Well, if key US allies come to believe that the United States is not going to have its back in a crisis, 
that's going to create momentum towards getting nuclear weapons in these countries. And I think that that's a significant concern that should not be downplayed or overlooked. Uh, so where does this leave us? The, the study of nonproliferation is often one where uh, we all say the sky's always falling. Uh, throughout history, ever since the, the dawn of the nuclear age, people have always been sounding the alarm bells about all the problems we face. And there certainly uh, are some problems. I don't want to, to downplay them. Uh, I don't think we're at a point where we're going to see wholesale nuclear weapons proliferation. That is, I don't think it's the case that 10 years from now, five or 10 additional countries are going to have nuclear weapons. But I do think there is a risk that in light of what's going on in, in North Korea and Iran, depending on how those situations are handled, and in light of concerns about the reliability of the US nuclear umbrella, it wouldn't be crazy to think that we might see one or two or three more countries making serious pushes towards getting nuclear weapons in, in the coming decade. And I think that that would be a major blow both to the nonproliferation regime, but also very damaging for US national security. I'll leave it there and look forward to questions and discussion. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me out. I will just do that classic thing of saying I'm just speaking in my personal capacity, not representing CSIS or any prior employers. Um, but what I'm going to try to do, I, I think um, Jason talked about how the deterrence landscape has been transforming and, and kind of made, a, I think, a very strong case about how it's actually kind of turned a bit upside down. And, you know, Matt, you talked about how the nonproliferation regime requires constant tending um, to have its success. It's not success that just happens on its own. It is successful, but it's successful in a deliberate, proactive way that has required a great amount of leadership. I think I'm going to touch on both of those, but it's in that context of we need leadership on nonproliferation. We need to understand how to adapt to a changing security environment, and into that descends the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review. I titled my talk, The State of the Debate on the Nuclear Posture Review, Key Issues, Red Herrings, and the Nature of Change. Um, so for those of you who don't follow this on a regular basis or don't check your Twitter about the NPR all the time, you may not be aware that it has been a highly emotive debate. People are just up in arms on all sides of this issue. So the 2018 NPR has paradoxically uh, created varying reactions that suggest the review opens the door to nuclear war fighting or closes it, raises the nuclear threshold and yet lowers it, continues Obama administration policies and programs or departs from them dramatically, goes too far in portraying a confrontational approach with Russia and, yet, and China and yet really doesn't go far enough. It's both stabilizing and destabilizing. It is, this is my favorite, fundamentally different from the Obama administration's nuclear posture review, but it is also largely the same. And that's all true. It all depends on where you sit. What's the context in which you interpret the information, and what does it mean to you, and the broader context. So I'm going to give you kind of a tip on how to interpret the nuclear posture review contextually. Okay? So here's really the bottom line, and then we'll go back and fill in the holes. So think about a political continuum, all right? The nuclear posture review of 2010 represented a slightly left of center compromise perspective on nuclear policy, which fell somewhat to the right of the president's preferences and his preferences of those of his key allies on the Hill and many key NGO and it, um, highly influential interest groups that felt they were part of bringing him to power. They saw him as being stronger, and they were disappointed because the 2010 NPR um, came somewhat uh, to the you know, right of that. In other words, the 2010 NPR was sort of a moderating voice on the political climate at the time. All right? Now, flash forward to 2018. The 2018 NPR is a slightly right of center, fully mainstream document, largely believable by those that range of, of folks, but which is, 
importantly, left of the preferences and perspectives of many within the Republican establishment, and certainly many, uh, to some extent, it would appear, to the president and statements and other comments that he had made in the past, and of many of his allies on the Hill. So the problem is, how emotional is this debate, and where is it, and how do you see the views? Are Really, are you sitting on either side of the overall nuclear policy debate, which has a span that looks like this? Or are you looking within that fairly moderate space of traditional nuclear posture reviews, which are, have represent a span that's a lot more like this? Okay, That's really what is going on politically. So the document falls largely within the nuclear policy mainstream. It shares a great deal in common with prior assessments, but the differences convey considerable substantive and symbolic weight in ways that feed an already highly polarized and emotional debate within the nuclear policy, arms control, and non-proliferation community. This, in turn, sits within a politically polarized national context that I would have to say is not like any other I've experienced in my lifetime. So what I'm going to do, what are some of the things that are the same? The review contains considerable continuity with its predecessor in policy and program specifics and reflects considerable political and policy conflict. The 2018 NPR fully supports the retention and modernization of the current triad of delivery systems. It um, emphasizes the importance of a modernized and strengthened nuclear command and control and communication system and reiterates the need to invest in U.S. nuclear weapons infrastructure, primarily in the national laboratories. This is largely the same as the modernization program that was proposed and supported by the Obama administration that goes back to the ratification of New START, which was part of an essential compromise in terms of pursuing modernization while pursuing arms reduction in the form of the treaty. So those things are very similar. Many critics of the modernization program in terms of cost and policy were equally critical of the Obama administration's policies and programs on modernization. So just because it's the same doesn't mean it's not controversial. Unsurprisingly, this NPR also rejects both sole purpose doctrine. Sole purpose doctrine is a doctrine in which that states nuclear weapons shall only be used to deter nuclear attack, no other type of attack. Um, this nuclear posture review rejects no first use, which is that nuclear weapons will only be used if they are used by another state uh, first, and we are only use it in response. But keep in mind, the 2010 NPR came to the exact same conclusion, virtually, and a re-review of nuclear policy late in the Obama administration, um, very, very late, similarly came to reject both the doctrine and declaratory policies based on these approaches. So let's talk some about what are some of the big differences and some of the controversies that have kind of lit up in the Twitter sphere. The 2018 Nuclear Posture Review lays out a pretty strong and compelling logic that the world is more dangerous than eight years ago. That our potential competitors and adversaries see great value in, the in their own nuclear arsenals in terms of bolstering their role in the world, and that the United States needs to pay greater attention and place higher priority on our own deterrence posture in return, or risk perpetuating a world in which, in which nuclear risks grow and may be increasingly unstable. And that actually is not that controversial either. I think a pretty wide piece of the spectrum, certainly that middle like posture review to posture review one I described, I think there's wide agreement that the threat environment has shifted and needs to be addressed. The hows and the whys and how that work, that's where the issues come into play. Biggest thing that was proposed in the nuclear posture review were a very specific and really fairly discrete and fairly small set of capability enhancements. These are additional sea launch capabilities um, that seek to provide lower yield and shorter range options for the nuclear arsenal. And this has dominated the controversy list. In the near term, this includes modification of a limited number of submarine launched ballistic missile, ballistic missiles, sorry, I can't talk to you today warheads to provide lower yield options. In the longer term, this in includes the reintroduction of a nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile um, that is, seems to be similar, although it has not been said this way, to the uh, 
TUMN capability that was actually retired out of the force it coincident with the 2010 NPL. Now, critics of the proposal stress this could lower the nuclear threshold with more, nu more usable nuclear weapons, and proponents suggest just the opposite. They believe they need to convince potential adversaries, particularly Russia, that there's no low-yield gap that they can exploit in their favor and that falls below an effective and appropriate retaliatory response from the United States. This is where we can come back to this, where I think my description would be a little bit different from, from Jason's, where I don't think it's so much about being able to fight limited war, but being concerned, I think, for those proponents, they are concerned that there is a perceived gap by Russia. They perceive somehow that our existing capabilities in the lower yield area are insufficient, and therefore it might create an incentive for them to consider a low yield use in such a way that they think we would not retaliate in kind. Now there are a lot of ifs and suppositions that go into that series of conclusions, um, but one, another one that I would just comment on is that in fact we do have low yield options inside the arsenal. We have it within our air leg, um, we would have it on our air launch cruise missile, and we have it within our dual capable aircraft. So there are a variety of other options. What they are not is quite as prompt um, and uh, have as, as flexible in terms of location as would be available on one of our submarines. So this becomes, uh, and I may just sort of cut off a lot and so we can cover more in Q&A. Um, so what I want to say is that's really the big debate has been about that capability. Now there's some supplements to that in terms of um, a counter to the Russian violations on the INF Treaty um, and the idea that if we put some capabilities out there, they would be covered. But let me just say, I personally am not persuaded that the options lower the nuclear threshold, primarily because they are intended to retaliate to a first use by someone else. So someone else is already, you know, in this theory, someone else is already used first. If we were proposing it as a first use weapon, I think you would sort of get into this question about are we lowering thresholds, but you're responding to the lowering threshold of someone else. So that's a little bit problematic. Um, I think it's reasonable um, for the president to want a range of scalable and appropriate responses if he or she ever needs to respond to a nuclear, especially a limited nuclear attack by someone else. But that's not new. That has been an expectation throughout that the president would expect to see a range of scalable options. So this is really just about the packaging of the delivery systems and whether or not what we have that's already scalable, is it sufficient or not? So it's a debate, but it becomes a fairly refined one. The second line of argumentation focuses on whether or not these capabilities are destabilizing. In other words, by the introduction of these capabilities or consideration of their use, would they create a situation in which a, a conflict would reach higher levels of, of of intensity um, or trigger follow-on nuclear use in ways that we can't control. This is played out, and I'd refer you actually to a series of articles that have been in War, the, War on the Rocks that you might find useful. Um, one was written by Bipin Rang, one was written by Austin Long, and then the third one was written by Frank Miller. And these, you can draw some of your own conclusions, but it talks about some of these theories and what's been happening and who believes what in terms of the stability arguments. The instability argument, those who say this is destabilizing, rests predominantly on some of the issues that Vipin Narang has called the, discrimi the discrimination problem. In other words, there's no way to tell if it's a big warhead or a lower yield warhead or even if it's a single versus multi um, warhead launch. And therefore, the adversary, mostly Russia, would always think the worst and would always act according to their perception before they actually realize what had occurred on the ground. So. If it's a single launch of a single missile with a lower yield weapon off of one of our boomers, the argument would be, wouldn't Russia act even before it landed as if the boomer had lit off all of its, you know, merved warheads? Some of us don't find that completely plausible. We think there's more than, a, you know, more context to why a country would respond rather than just saying, I see a single missile, therefore there must be 15. Um, <laughs> So, but that's really the argument. There's a second argument that has to do with whether or not, um, how much risk 
is being imposed on the submarine from which it's launched. In other words, how much by lighting off a single lower yield you know, missile have you put at risk that sub and its entire payload, okay, because it could be retargeted back. So to just briefly touch on those two, those two arguments, I think Austin makes a very good point that in fact the UK, which relies on a mana, a single um, nuclear capability that is only available on its submarines, has actually carried exactly these types of configurations of D5 Trident missiles throughout because since they only have sub-launch missiles, can you, you know, it makes sense, right? If you were the, the British Prime Minister, would you only want to be told that you had these, you know, multi-huge kiloton warhead options? No. So they have had lower yield capabilities and lower yield options at sea throughout. Somehow the world didn't come to an end, we haven't been destabilized before you. So there's really a lot of questions about that that I think raise some good questions about whether this is really uh, the end of stability. Um, in terms of finding, you know, the sub and coming back, um, I think that Frank Miller has put out, you know, some good arguments that suggest that's already well trained for. They plan for that. They think the evasion, you know, is is viable, um, and there and therefore, if that in fact was the appropriate response um, by a president based on the, the use of a nuclear weapon by another country, both the risk would be acceptable and the evasive techniques would probably be there to give a reasonable chance of survival. You know, we can decide what we think about that, but there's a strong debate that's out there. Um, I'll, my bottom line on this piece really is that I think the proponents of the capability have the deterrence theory on their side. I personally kind of come down and I get it. Um, and I, I think there's that their logic holds. I'm just not sure that they have necessity or practicality on their side. Um, while these capabilities might be nice to have, I'm not really persuaded that the need can't be met through the existing lower yield options in the force, namely the penetrating bomber, the air launch cruise missile, and our dual capable aircraft. And given what we have already seen, which is the political and budgetary risks in this controversy, and that it introduced to the overall critically important modernization program, for me, it just comes down to, is the juice worth the squeeze? I'm not totally sold it is. But that's a very different line of argumentation than one based on deterrence theory, and I'm happy to kind of have more discussion. There's a few other issues that have come back. It sounds like Mark wants to get us to, you know, to a conversation. What I will do is tee up a few things that I think are important, and I'm going to hope you ask about them. Okay? We can talk about the issue of, which is the other big controversy, um, does this NPR suggest or broaden the role and purpose of nuclear weapons by suggesting they could be used in response to non-nuclear attack. Now, remember I said we've never had a sole purpose doctrine. But there's a lot of debate about whether that's occurred. So I'd like to talk about that. I'd like to talk about the warhead plan and whether or not some of the things included in the overall review are really viable, A, and B, are we paying enough attention of what, to what needs to happen through the laboratory complex because there's an enormous burden on them right now and their, their budgetary support on the Hill and so forth is, is rather lacking. I'd like to talk about leadership and the non on nonproliferation and nuclear security. This review <coughs> pays a bit of lip service to that, but doesn't suggest that the U.S. is really going to exercise leadership there. That's a mistake. I believe the United States needs to be able to walk and chew gum, and that means being able to be a leader on deterrence and extended deterrence, and being a leader on nonproliferation and arms control. And we're going to have to do both to kind of sustain the broader types of coalitions that we need, and in order to play the kind of role in the world that we want to play. So we can come back to all of those topics. Um, I just want to say also there's a broader context. And I will just put that, you know, I'm going to go ahead and touch the elephant in the room. Um, that these ends of the political spectrum matter, okay? It does make a difference. It is the context in which this arrives. So keep in mind there's a domestic political context, especially on Capitol Hill, um, and that in fact this administration was doing a lot of compromise. There were a lot of people on the Hill who did not get things they wanted in the nuclear posture review. 
So there were a lot of things that could have been, quote unquote, a lot worse. This NPR steers clear of many controversial and highly divisive outcomes. It supports existing arms control obligations, including INF and New START does not propose that we exit or break out. It supports the moratorium on nuclear testing. It does not propose stockpile expansion. Um, it retains, and this was hard fought for folks on the inside, it retains negative security assurances that make clear that the United States will not use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states. Um, that are also members of the NPT and in compliance with their non-proliferation obligations. So those are some very important things that were included that aren't always appreciated in the debate. What's the bottom line, though? The Nuclear Posture Review is supposed to represent the views of the entire government and the policy going forward it includes critical elements of our declaratory posture. But at the end of the day, these are the President's weapons. And at the end of the day, it is the President's words that matter in the context of declaratory policy. So I think for this administration in particular, the challenge will be, as I described that moderating influence, whether that plays out in the programs and plans and activities of the, of the President, and that will include things such as responding on JCPOA, what happens with our North Korea policy, as well as what happens in terms of Russia and how we engage in arms control, non-proliferation, and other things. So the words and deeds of the president will ultimately trump what happens in the review itself. So Marv asked me to talk about how we maintain the stockpile without underground testing and to introduce myself. Yeah, do that first. So I'll, I'll introduce myself first. I don't know how many of you were at Rebecca's uh, talk last yesterday evening. I am one of those uh, dinosaur nuclear priests. Um, I've been in the weapons program since 1989. I participated as we ended the Cold War. Um, and transitioning our nuclear weapons maintenance and all through the period now where we don't have underground testing anymore. And I want to talk about that. I've, I've done technical roles, moved up to where I am today. Today, I run the nuclear weapons program at Los Alamos. I'm the guy who advises the director and pulls the briefs together to tell the director whether the stockpile, the part that's in our care at Los Alamos, whether it's safe, secure, and reliable don't do effective. All the policy documents you see will say safe, secure, and effective. Effective is a question for these folks. It's a question for the military. It's not a question for me and the role at Los Alamos. Now, today I'll say I am speaking a lot of my own opinions. I'm not speaking on behalf of Los Alamos. Uh, I actually took a vacation so that I could make sure that I was speaking on my own behalf and not on Lanel's behalf. I'll refer to Lanel a lot because I know it well. So the, I'm going to break Marv's question into two parts. How do we maintain the stockpile? And then how do we do that without underground testing? Because they're two different things. And I don't think it's widely understood how we do either one of those. So let me start with uh, maintenance. Since the cessation of testing, US stockpile has been maintained through efforts called lifetime extension programs and major alterations. And that's been monitored on a yearly basis with something we call the annual assessment. So I'll start with the annual assessment. Each year, we've got this collection of weapon systems out there. There's seven major stockpile systems. Los Alamos is assigned four. We have a lot of variants in the four that were assigned, so it feels like more, because the B61 has a lot of different flavors. There's the flavor of the month on that all of which are going to get consolidated down in a major LEP this time. But we take the stockpile and we sample it. We pull things back from the field. We pull things back off of the submarines. We pull things out of shelves. And we look at them. We do, in some cases, complete teardowns of the weapons. In some cases, we do non-disruptive um, assays on the weapons. And we look at the state of components. We have to do that because nuclear weapons, there's nasty stuff in there. Uh, there's plutonium. There are chemicals that are known to be carcinogens in the state of California. 
and they're all mixed <laughs> up in this big radiation case thing, and it's like this chemistry experiment that you're letting go. Originally, we thought for 15 years, and then 20, 25. Now people are talking ridiculously long times. Um, where from a science, and, and I'm just going to talk about sort of engineering the time for a policy folks. Still. Um, it's this chemical stew that's hard to predict and hard to know how long they'll live. So we keep looking, and if we become concerned at what we see, because we see things that look like rust, we see plastics degrade and crack. You've got plastics in near plutonium. That's not a good thing. That'll rot. The plastic, just like the sun, will rot the battery in the car. Right? So these things fall apart, and we have to keep rebuilding the systems. We have to keep refreshing them so that we can assure that they'll work. That doesn't mean we're making a new weapon. Right? It just means we're taking care of it. We're changing the tires. So working with NNSA and the services and the other plants and labs, we're presently engaged. This goes to the, we're working very hard right now as a result of the current plan of record. We're working on two lifetime extension programs, the W76, which is a sub-launched warhead, was first introduced in the stockpile in 1978 which means it was designed to the threats of 1978. And that LE field could be complete in the next few years. And the B-6112, which is going to take that menagerie of B-61 variants and collapse them to one, um, and it'll replace pretty much all of the bomb's um, nuclear and non-nuclear components. Uh, to extend that life out, and we're, we're planning to have a first production unit of that in 2020. So that's the big things that are going on. We're refurbishing the airdrop bombs, we're refurbishing the 761. We've got two major alterations that are going on. One is the W88, it's called Alt 940, so that gives away what it is. And the other is called Alt 370. So the Alt 370, replacing some fuses, bringing them up to speed so they'll keep working and it can keep penetrating and holding at risk that which what it was already supposed to hold at risk. And we're fixing some other components that have aged inside of it. And they've aged to the point that a couple of years ago, we looked and said, if they age for a certain number more years, and I won't say what the number is, um, we won't be able to underwrite that nuclear performance. So you've got to go in. You've got to go fix that component. You've got to go do it now. Uh, if, if we do drop it today, I will say, uh, it would be bad to do that group. Okay, so to date, that description, to date, what we've done is we have frozen and maintained the stockpile that we built to end the Cold War. Okay, that stockpile had certain constraints on it to accomplish that mission for the nation. It was built on a concept of Mervin. So Mervin took the stockpile in a direction that you wouldn't take it if you didn't want to Merv. Mervin was there because MIRVs could overwhelm anti-ballistic missiles. In a world in which there were no constraints on the number of strategic warheads that you had, and there were no constraints on anti-ballistic missiles, and with the technology of targeting at the time, you won that battle economically through MIRV missiles. It was cheaper to throw many on one delivery vehicle. That, in a world with stark reductions, and no anti-ballistic missile threat. That's not the same threat that we face today. If I MIRV. MIRV, sorry. Multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. So the, the, the missile goes up, it's got something on it we call a bus. There's a bunch of these warheads riding on the bus. It gets in space, and as it's flying across your adversary, it goes boop, 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 and drops them where it wants to drop them. It's cheaper to throw that because in order to intercept it, you almost need a launch vehicle per warhead. And so in that economics of the 1980s, that was the way to stop up. So this is what we've done, and all we've done is polished those weapons for the last 25, 30 years. So now I'm going to turn to the loss of testing. How much time I've got? Oh, let's say five minutes. Okay, five minutes. So by the end of testing, Nuclear tests were providing two fundamental types of, of information. People think we went out and tested the weapons that are in the stockpile. That's not exactly true. Okay. The, the nuclear tests verified the principle of operation of the weapons that we have. 
and they provided scientific access to data that we needed to put into our theoretical models and combine with known science. Very few of the nuclear weapons that are, are in our stockpile were directly tested in the nuclear test. You could not afford to do it even then. We had to instrument the tests. We had to make sure the timing was right so that the scientific data could really guide the computer models that we used, even back in the 80s, to underwrite the nuclear weapon performance in the wide variety of possible applications. So, that, that, um, that change, that change has been fundamental for the last 25 years of nuclear stewardship. In order to certify these weapons in the absence of a nuclear test, we can no longer get matter at the right size, density, and temperature simultaneously. Matter, you know, atoms. You can't do that. If you do that, by definition, it's a nuclear bomb. You have to have that much energy density to get up to that matter. So what we do instead is we built this enormous scientific complex at the laboratories, reaching out into universities, well, and we break, we break the world down into small parts, much for the, if there's engineers here, there's at least a few I see, like a finite element model. Right? We break the world into these little tiny pieces of matter, and then we study them. And we can do those at the right density and temperature, and we can study them at a laser like now, and see how they respond. But that doesn't tell me whether they're all working together right. So to get the right size and density, but not the right temperature, because we don't go critical and we don't explode, I, I do those at facilities that take radiographs. We can take x-ray pictures and make movies of the implosions and the, and the moving of the bombs. And, and it's very complicated because when the bomb, when the part that I'm interested in, and the, well, I hope we never use, right, when that part is going, it isn't parts like gears and meshes and wires and stuff. It's just a big bag of jello, right? You've blown off the high explosive and it's a fluid. It's all just moving and you're predicting, will that fluid get in the right spot after coming through 100 G reentry deceleration and getting blown up as it's coming in? Is that going to do the right thing so the nuclear part works? So we do that through computers, this giant scientific apparatus. And it has challenged, uh, I want to end with a really interesting scientific thought on this, and then come back to the, the trouble that these guys are talking about. Um, the scientific thing is, is really neat. So most of us in this room are, we're trained that, that do physical sciences. We're trained in the post-inductivist era. Okay. Inductivism was the science of, of um, oil, You know, 1600s through the 1900s, there was the notion, the philosophy of a science was, I will prove my theory. And somewhere between about 1930 and 1970, Western science moved towards the, the principle of empirical falsification. You pose a hypothesis, you try to disprove it. You've heard Einstein's favorite quote, you can never prove me right, but one experiment can prove me wrong. That's where everything sits right now. So think about that within the context of no nuclear tests. I cannot do the experiment that would falsify my hypothesis directly. Okay. How do I bring science to something like that? And it's a really fascinating study. The laboratories have developed very interesting infrastructure for how do I do falsifiable, exp falsifiable experiments where I may and inductively couple them to what that means for the nuclear weapon. I think that we've lost an opportunity in general as being required to do that, to apply that to other examples where you need science informing policy, because we've got to tell these folks whether they're going to work and what they're going to do, and then they've got to figure out what posture the, the country wants. But the same kind of arguments apply to climate. We don't want to dump a bunch of crap in the atmosphere to see if our climate models right. Sorry. A bunch of uh, <coughs> stuff. stuff. <laughs> uh, 
there's a there's a new emerging science that's possible here as a result of the loss of nuclear testing that I find exciting. Um, for the folks, I'm, I'm going to I'm speaking now to raise an awareness, and I'm going to see heads nod for the engineers, and I'm going to see the policy folks go. Hmm, I thought about that. Engineering is fundamentally taught in two ways. When you go through undergraduate school, you learn analysis and you learn design. Okay. You learn early on in your career how, if somebody gives you a, an electrical circuit or a mechanical structure, how to uh, evaluate the current flows or the stresses. And as you get towards your senior year, you learn design. The principles of design points of, if I make my design like this, it will be robust against this. There are two kind of different skill sets. And you need the one first. For the last 25 years in weapons science, we've done a great job at maintaining the ability to do analysis. That's good. I've got a whole crew of people that can go out and if if we were to ever get the plans of somebody else's nuclear weapon, we could analyze them. And we can analyze our own. But design's a different thing. Design's about knowing how to build a structure that, or, or a thing that accomplishes an end. And you've heard about the low yield discussion. We've not exercised doing that design process. What's the end that I'm trying to accomplish? And in part, we don't do it because we're afraid of the signals that it would send for proliferation. We're afraid of the signals that it would send in terms of our adversaries interpreting our, our behaviors wrong. And we have to be afraid of those things. But it really cripples the ability to develop people who have that skill set. And we're still wrestling with the uh, Congress just passed something called the Stockpile Responsiveness Program, trying to put in the law that you have to exercise those people. And personally, I think you could exercise those people in such a way that you don't have to antagonize others. But there's a lot more debate and discussion that needs to go on. So with that, I think I'll Thank you all. Okay, I think I'll stand here. You guys can um, stay seated to answer questions, I assume. The microphone. I'm just going to open the floor for questions. We do have time. Dr. Cherry. So, uh, Dr. Webster, you said the technology informs the policy, or is it the other way? If the policy is set first and asks the technologist to do this, to meet the policy. I think you have to turn that one on. You have to turn this one on. So, so I'll, I'll start, but I'm sure that there's some other folks that want to uh, intervene on that question. It, it's only healthy when it's a cycle and going both ways. Um, we have examples where uh, policy has made decisions um, not fully informed of the te technological implications of those decisions that drive costs, drive, uh, drive things. And probably if everybody could have sat in the room and stepped back, you'd realize it wasn't, it wasn't necessary to make that particular policy decision. You could have achieved the same ends in a somewhat different way. Um, let, me, let me give a specific example. A number of years ago, we decided there would be no new nuclear weapons. Well, what was the real goal? The real goal was we don't want to change the posture of what targets we can hold at risk or how somebody has to interpret what we're doing. In setting that higher level policy, we also removed the ability to improve the safety of our nuclear weapons or to improve the environmental impacts on the maintenance processes that I was describing. And that was not the intent of, of the policy. The, the, the real intent was to ensure that we could get to a spot where we could reduce the reliance on the nuclear weapons. But I don't think anybody would disagree that being safer while you reduce your reliance on them is, is a good thing. And um, that's an example where we could have put a finer point on what new meant 
what the purpose was and, and added a lot of freedom. But I should have stimulated some, some further questions down or comments down. Well, let me get one, one reaction, and, and I, because I think I, I would say, for the most part, the technology side, the technical side, sets some boundaries for the policymakers more often than the other way. Because, let's face it, you know, if I'm a policymaker, I can't sort of say, you know, go get me widget W, right? I mean, it, if it's not possible, if it doesn't exist, um, you know, it's not going to get produced just because you, like, ask for it. Um, you know, and, and we can be quite magical in our requests. Um, so it, it doesn't really work that way. Um, and occasionally you might get lucky. You might, as a policymaker, say, all right, to negotiate this arrangement, I need a, techno a technological solution that will allow me to detect something or to uh, evaluate something or assess or analyze something or to verify something, just to use those examples, right? I might be able to say, can you go get me something that does this? But chances are they'll look back at me and be like, yeah, just give me a lot of money, a lot of time, and I still may not get it. Um, so more often, it's a question of how far can I go? I'm going to, a, you know, we could imagine this dialogue. I'm saying, how far can I go? Do I have something I can do with this? Give me a boundary that I can work with. Um, and, and hopefully you're having a dialogue. Someone say, gee, but maybe I can, they might have an idea. Now, it's one thing that's pretty awesome is sometimes they have, they can create a policy enabling technical solution. So if I know there's a technical solution out there for a particular problem, then you can take that into a policy discussion or an international negotiation. And it opens policy space because you've eliminated a technical barrier. But rarely can we kind of be like, just get me one of those, you know. Actually, that's a huge, if you read the CTBT, you know, the, the actual part about what's banned in testing is very thin. Almost all of it is the technology able, enabled policy associated with verification. Most of the treaty is actually about that. That's true. I will remark that that science and policy question was offered by someone who's the director of a center that has science and policy in the Netherlands. <laughs> It's also been a big topic of what we've been discussing about the last two days. I mean, yeah. it is very much part of what we live um, yeah, in the business. Yeah, from, uh, you know, President Kennedy's uh, talk about put the man on the moon by this day, you know. So was that technology informed uh, policy making? That was in my mind when I asked that question. So I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it was pretty risky. Yeah. It was pretty risky, right? People, people died. Yeah. More questions? Yes, Alex. So this is kind of for the policy side. In the world right now, the United States and Russia are the two primary nuclear powers. So in terms of deterrence, would it be kind of a better thing from our perspective if, say, you know, uh, another major country were to come into play and really produce more nuclear weapons to kind of create a, a third party and like offset the, the complete scale, you know, kind of just a three-way balance? You're the proliferation. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's certainly an interesting idea. Um, I tend to view additional countries getting nuclear weapons as uh, the net effect of that tends to be really bad from my vantage point. So, so I would say we already, to a certain degree, have the situation you're talking about. So. Uh, Russia and the United States uh, maintain the largest nuclear arsenals right now, but other countries like China and Pakistan are increasing their nuclear capabilities. Uh, Pakistan has the, I believe it's still true, the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in terms of the, the percentage increase. Now that's in part because it was small and getting bigger. Going from, you know, 200 to 400 is a 50, is a, you know, you're doubling the size of your of your arsenal there. Uh, to achieve the same effect, the United States would have to go from you know 1,500 to 3,000. Um, so it's a little bit misleading to say it's the fastest growing nuclear arsenal. But in any case, uh, it's not just the United States and Russia. There are seven other nuclear powers. 
uh, India, Pakistan, uh, North Korea now, Britain, France. Uh, and so to a certain extent, I, I think what we're seeing, particularly among China, uh, might provide that, that countervailing force that you're talking about. I meant to kind of reward that in the sense that whenever there's a, a major world decision by Russia, the entire NATO and the alliance tree looks towards the United States for a response. No. Yeah, would there be a way for someone else in that alliance to take on some of that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you mean German, German nuclear weapon? <laughs> <laughs> well, we already we have three nuclear powers in NATO, right? We have France, Britain, and the United States. Although France um, is a complicated story. Uh, under Charles de Gaulle, France withdrew from the military arm of, of NATO. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, maybe maybe the British, if you're concerned about that, maybe the British could step up to. To a greater degree. I mean, in what you're talking, what you're, I think you're hinting at is the issue of alliance burden sharing, which is as old as alliances themselves. Um, for literally thousands of years, uh, countries have thought about how to um, sh effectively and fairly share the burden within a, within an alliance, and it's certainly something that we're still struggling in within within NATO today. But they actually have, um, I mean, in many ways that actually does exist right now, and it's partly because of the dynamics with France and, and the UK, um, and it's called that second center of decision making. So the idea is that you have decision making within the decision making bodies within NATO, and then the three nuclear powers retain independent national decision making authorities as well. So the idea being that you have this kind of exactly what you described, some of this countervailing waiting to um, add to an adversary, uh, to add to the idea that an adversary must assume that between those varying centers of decision, action will occur, right? So that it won't be just sort of kind of taken hostage in the NATO process. So that's a very real part of the doctrine and dynamics amongst um, the nuclear deterrent posture within NATO. But let me push your question further beyond process and burden sharing. I think what you're trying to say is, let's play a little America first for a moment, right? Can we get out of this business and have someone else do it, right? And this is the first election in a long time uh, since Lindbergh, right, where you had people saying maybe it's not good that we're extending deterrence to Europe and Asia, and maybe we should let these wealthy Europeans have beautiful airports and roads and uh, uh, socialized welfare systems that we're subsidizing. Maybe we should let them uh, provide for their own nuclear deterrent, right? And, and Matt's right that this is the consummate problem that we deal with alliances, right? Like We complain all the time that the Europeans are free riding. Problem is we like that. We've run the experiment when they don't free ride. Uh, when they provide for their own security, the world's a dangerous place, is what we've concluded. And so you have to choose your poison. Do you want to extend deterrence for Europeans, or do you want them to provide for their own security? And the truth is, there are costs to both. And I can see those costs varying by region, by the way. Yes, go ahead. Um, many of y'all have mentioned uh, limited nuclear warfare between the United States and Russia, now we need to modernize our low, our low yield uh, uh, technology in order to bring it apart with what the Russians see as a gap. But doesn't all limited nuclear warfare for the human condition progress to full nuclear warfare? So what is the point of having a study matter? Wouldn't a better deterrent be you launch any nuclear no matter what the yield, we will respond in full retaliation. So uh, when I look at the nuclear posture review, I don't put it on a left-right spectrum. I interpret it as depending on your views of how you think deterrence works. And uh, my friend uh, uh, Jamie Nolan would say uh, the nuclear posture review is only dangerous if you throw it at someone. <laughs> uh, there are other people uh, that I know who think deterrence works when you have uh, the capability to limit damage that is striking first or second to limit damage to yourself. So you really want nuclear superiority. And they think limited nuclear war is, is kind of a pointy-headed academic thing, and they're really not interested in that. 
And so you have a lot of people who are in just this middle category, and, and, they're, and they're worried about the situation where someone uses one, and how do we respond, right? Uh, Andy and I have been to lunch many times and had this conversation, and his response is ignore it, right? And continue the conventional fight. Uh, other people will say, we have to get to this onesie twosie business. Now, the problem is, I agree with you. I am not, I am not optimistic about controlling escalation. And, I, frankly, I think a lot of the authors of the NPR are not optimistic yeah. about it either. And so what they're trying to say is, if we build the capability, then maybe no one will use it. You're trying to front load deterrence. You're saying, I'm in the middle, middle of the ladder too, and I can respond, and inshallah, you won't do this. Right. I, I, think, that's, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, and therefore, I think, I think the authors and the proponents of these new capabilities are not doing it because they think you can control escalation. Really just the opposite. They're concerned, in fact, that you can't, and that, but that if there's a perception gap, if deterrence is all about perception, if they believe on, you know, as they read um, Russian doctrine and get other information that the adversary believes there's a gap, then they suggest, well, perhaps we need to fill it. And the, at the heart of that is, is there a concern that an adversary may believe we would be self-deterred if we only had other options that were much larger and seemed overwhelmingly disproportionate? So we could threaten that massive response to a very limited attack. The question is, is that threat credible? And if anyone on either side of that deterrence equation believes that threat is incredible, then there's the risk that deterrence fails. I do think there are some people, though, that do believe you can fight and control limited nuclear war. I'm not one of those people. I'm not there, either, yeah. But there are some people who do who do pray at that temple. Uh, and, and I've had, you know, I've done work for this one of those offices, and we get into conversations quickly about which targets are escalatory and which targets are not. <laughs> and I go home to my wife and say, guess what happened in your Pentagon today? <laughs> I'd rather not just. I'd rather not do any of these targets. But there are people, and and there's a long tradition in American nuclear strategic thought. Right. Right. And it, it came. Of, it really came of age in in the, in the late Carter administration. PD fifty nine is deep in our DNA, and we've been talking about this stuff since the beginning. But really, from the late nineteen seventies, it hasn't gone away. But I, that is my point that there is a spectrum of thought that's much wider than is sort of reflected in the document, or for that matter, the prior documents. So when I, I think the authors of this NPR do not pray at that temple. That's not the problem they think they're solving, or they, they don't think they're proposing that solution. Now, there might be others on the outside who think that, yes, that's nice, but that's the outcome you're creating, and that's why we have a debate. Yeah. But they're not pursuing it with that intention, they're pursuing with the intention that I described. And the good thing about the NPR is it's forcing that conversation. Mm -hmm. It's That's forcing true. us to revisit how deterrence works, and if it fails, what does it look like, and how do we turn it off? Because for a long time we've been searching for off-ramps, and people are like, oh, don't worry, this will never happen. But what if it does? There's actually a, a technological um, aspect of this as well that I think, I think folks have Folks have forgotten what nuclear weapons do, yeah. right? They just don't realize how simultaneously huge they are and how simultaneously small they are. And in and, and thinking through the discussion, it's not enough to think, um, because you, you don't want to be self-deterred, it's not enough to think if a nuke is thrown is what, because the only thing, I, I, as I told you, we built, we built a stockpile for MAD, right? Our response is right now is just on the homeland somewhere, yeah. right? So suppose so so nuclear weapons take a take what they're calling low yield, you know, ten kilotons for Christ's sake. That's Hiroshima. You know, this is not some tiny thing. But if you had done Hiroshima with the right type of weapon at high altitude or in the right spot, you could take out a carrier group. Would we do a massive intercontinental exchange over somebody blasting a, a carrier group, an aircraft carrier group? Is, it, is that credible that that's how we'd respond? Because if it's not, you've lost the deterrent to doing that if the yield is small enough to go after that. Right? And so that, that whole 
that whole interaction um, of the horrible, um, but actually in many cases very limited effects of a nuclear weapon, that kind of got lost. It feels to me like your buddies at Rand stopped doing their studies for a while. No, a lot of them died. I mean, people that, <laughs> people that mentored me passed. Yeah, and, and, and that's a real problem because people have forgotten yeah. actually the technology. These guys are worried about works. terrorism. <laughs> so, I would like to do an experiment. So, what the, the uh, conversation here is talking about perception, the, the perception part and the credibility part of the Turing's equation. So, here's a scenario. Um, a conflict starts in Europe. It's not going well for Russia. Or perhaps they have an objective they think this will help them achieve. And they send a one-tenth of a kiloton weapon at an airfield and destroy it. And they send a one-tenth of a kiloton weapon at another airfield and they destroy it. Do you believe, do you believe, this is a raise your hand if you believe question, <clears throat> that the U.S. would launch a 100 kiloton response? Is that a credible threat? Do you believe we would? Does anybody else? Speech to the current administration? Yes. <laughs> 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 it's a good point. Because that comes into the equation. The man man there. Who's, whose fingers on the button comes into the equation? But, but Mark, this, is it the point? Not whether what we believe. No, of course. It's just the but experiment. The Russians think that we might or might not yes. do. Yes. And do they want to take the chance that we wouldn't do something like that? Right. My next question is, if you got to decide, would you pull that trigger? Let's see that show of hands. For the 100 kiloton response to the two one-tenth of a kiloton. Maybe give them a sense of the magnitude of that. And What's the target? That's the question. Pick a target. Pick a target for what? For the 100 kiloton response to the Russians taking out the I mean, it almost doesn't matter, because either, you know, unless you decide you're just going to boil a lot of ocean. I mean, the, the, so otherwise, it's landing on land. I mean, a 100 a kiloton a weapon. Target. It's massive. Yeah, it's <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah. So the I'm, question I'm, is, is that a credible? Another thing is, when the general public will hear that Russia dropped a half kilo or a half ton nuclear no, weapon, it, they're going to say, oh, it's a nuclear weapon, and everyone's going to kind of freak out and create momentum for a big response. Yeah, but there's a lot of big between that and 100 kiloton. I mean, I'm just, I don't believe, all right, so I'll just, I mean, I can't help myself. I don't believe even, I believe even President Trump would say, are you serious? Bring me bring me something else. Yeah. Yeah. I think he would say, I, I, I don't, so I think he would look at that and say, seriously, that is what you're telling me my, my one option is? It's one way to achieve escalation dominance. <laughs> yeah. It's also a way to almost guarantee the end of the world. So, I mean, it. that's just, I don't believe, I, I really think that, you know, now the big debate, the enormous debate that would occur is, does the response have to be nuclear, or because the range of the attack was fell below thresholds, which is why you picked that number, right. fell below and into thresholds yeah. that could begin to be equated with very high-end conventional responses. The debate would be, can we respond conventionally or to just, this nuclear use? Or just win. Just, yeah. just win, yeah. So that would be the just, you know, over the top, but it would not, you know, they, so I, I, they would expect to use a lower yield response. I don't want you to nuclear. walk away just with those numbers and that scenario in your head, but I want you to walk away this thinking about... <laughs> <laughs> I want you to walk away thinking about our planners have to worry about a whole range of scenarios like this, and it is their job to deter that kind of, um, well, that kind of aggression, right? It, it's the job. And um, so don't think it's easy, you know. There, there's a lot of scenarios I could throw at you where you'd have a hard time deciding what to do. And even if you got to think about that scenario in advance, you might have a hard time deciding what our force should look like so that you would have, remember, you've got to put yourself in the other person, the, the adversary's um, mind and say, okay, would this deter them? Would they, is this a credible 
uh, threat of of a consequence that they don't want to happen. So, any any more comments on that from the panel? Here's a question. A question. Yes. So, a deterrence fails, and there is maybe a low yield nuclear weapon used against us. What's America's time limit to respond? That's a Depends on your views on deterrence, right? The, well, who makes that decision? Someone has to respond. It's, it's not the president. The, the president will make the decision, but where that's thought about, he'll get like a Chinese menu of A, B, or C, right? <laughs> it's, it, it might be worth describing the room. Yeah. How, how the president gets informed mm -hmm. on something like that. Right. This, there's, not, there's not literally somebody sitting with a finger going, ready. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of process that would, you know, I, I, so there's a tremendous, I'm, I'm uncomfortable because I don't want to describe too much of the process because I, I, I can't remember where all the lines are. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I yeah, thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, but there is, a, there is a robust process to assure communications to the president and to ensure that advice from all corners, your military advisors, your legal advisors, and others are available and can convene under extraordinary circumstances to provide the appropriate advice quickly to the president. There are also mechanisms that allow things to go even faster, but mostly in those circumstances where you're talking about extreme time frames, the principal situation in which the extreme time frames, like you have 30 minutes to respond, are scenarios that are kind of called launch under attack scenarios. Those are when you think something massive is coming our way and you want to respond before the attack has actually culminated. Okay, So it's a, it is actually a specific set of scenarios and it is true that we've established over time and practiced procedures that allow it to be physically possible to reply in that time frame. That said, that doesn't mean, depending on what you're seeing or what has occurred, that you should or that you have to. Yeah. Let's say you see a single launch. You might wisely say, this is terrible, but I'm going to wait and see what happens. I'm going to confirm what it is. I'm going to do the battle damage assessment. I'm going to take the time. And then I'm going to respond. Now, so then the response is less about how do I beat a window and more about what are the needs of the situation. If you are in the process of losing a war, you know, which is conceived, you know, anywhere in the world, we're about to go down, you know, conventionally, for whatever reason, then, you know, you would have one type of urgency. I say all of this because the current scenarios, I think this is really important, current scenarios are, we, people are thinking a lot about North Korea. Should we do this first? What happens if they tease up, up a missile? What, you know, and I would just simply say in those scenarios, North Korea can do some terrible things, but it is incredibly important for us to remember we are a lot bigger, we are a lot better, we will crush them. Mm -hmm. So we don't automatically have to play by the timeline rules that have governed the idea of you know massive retaliation launch under attack, um, and, and that there is no thing that says you have to push the button within a certain number of minutes. There's a difference between really, really terrible and existential threat. But in the North Korea scenario, there will be a time urgency to do conventional counterforce, that is to go Huge. after their nuclear weapons with conventional. Yeah. And that, I think, I mean, I agree with Vipin on this, that if there's a war in the Korean Peninsula, someone will eat a nuke. Oh, I think it has overtaken, I would say, again, because I don't mind speculating, I'm out of government and all that stuff, but I am at this point more concerned about use emanating from the Korean Peninsula or involving that type of conflict um, where the first use incentives are running very, very high actually on both sides um, than I am even about India-Pakistan, yeah. which for years so many of us were like, oh, the most likely use of a nuclear weapon is an India-Pakistan scenario. And I believe this other scenario has now surpassed it. Me too. So in, in that context, um, when you add to that maybe alliance structures evolving, maybe whether or not Japan, South Korea can actually count on us for their deterrence, then what is the purpose of that alliance if first strike cannot be guaranteed to, let's say, Japan or South Korea? Is it 
it's we're thinking of oh what if North Korea fires a nuke at us, but what if they fire a nuke at Japan? Right. What good is it to Japan for us to play the whole oh well we'll just wait and see what happens and then we'll respond whether conventionally or with a nuclear weapon. In my time in government, the Japanese always ask for the tea lamp in. Can we bring that back? Because yeah. we're, we're <laughs> afraid that you only have a hammer and you won't respond. And so yeah, they're very worried about that. And I think this nuclear posture review reflects the, the desire, or at least a debate, about options that are at lower yield. So we will retaliate. We'll do it promptly. They're very worried about that. What's difficult in those scenarios, which also makes them more plausible, which is extremely worrying, is there would really be no intercept, you know, there's no, there is no launch under warning, you know, launch under attack option in space that small, right? So no matter what, you would be responding post-detonation unless you had an opportunity to uh, prevent or preempt, you know, with great intelligence, whether you did that conventionally or via a, nu a nuclear capability pre-launch. You're not going to... Yeah, you know, there's just there's no counter in a launch, you know, to land window that's that small in a space that's that small. So I think there's, a, you know, they know that that's the case. The question is just bigger picture about whether or not um, do they believe does North Korea believe we would respond? Does Japan and South Korea believe we would respond? And do they believe in any way that the United States is more self deterred? because of the nature and the content of our arsenal, the size and shape of the arsenal, the actual capability, or do they believe any sense that we would refrain from use has more to do with our political will? And let me just add quickly, that deterrence is a function of at least two things. One is probability and one is consequences. It need not be the case that North Korea must believe that there's a 100% probability the U.S. would retaliate with nuclear forces in order to deter. Arguably, that probability is much lower, and it could even be well below 50%, because the consequences of U.S. nuclear use would be so devastating for North Korea, even if it thinks there's only a, a 10 or 20% chance that that might happen, that still might be enough to to deter them. We could yeah, debate yeah. about where that threshold is, but it's important to consider both likelihood and consequences. That's existential for them. Dr. Jason, you hinted uh, in your speech that you're somewhat of an isolationist. I'm sorry. Is that the personal preference to keep your sanity, or is it because you think that it's actually the safe way to go? Uh, <laughs> it was definitely about my sanity, and I'm glad I have one brother in the audience with me. Uh, you know, I think that force is a blunt instrument, and I think that extended deterrence is very dangerous, and I think we have to, we, we should be more selective of where we are uh, projecting military power. Uh, and I recently gave a talk at Brookings, and the uh, Bob Kagan didn't swallow his tongue when I said that, uh, unlike a lot of my colleagues who want to withdraw from the world, I, I, I think we should stay in East Asia, but I'm not excited about uh, poking around with the bear in the Baltics. Uh, so I think you have to make choices about, I, I just don't believe in garrisoning the planet. Uh, we don't have an Avita Perón printing machine, so I, I would, we got to make choices about the defense budget and prioritize things. and. I think East Asia is, is where we should focus our efforts. I think the Europeans are very wealthy. That's why I go there for vacation. Uh, and when I talk to Germans, they're not that afraid of the Russians. We're more afraid of the Russians. So uh, if the canary in the coal mine is not worried, then, then why should I be worried? And, but that's, you know, that runs counter the, to the conventional wisdom. That's something you can't say in your cubicle in the Pentagon, right? Because you'll be working on military pensions if you say something like that. Uh, and that's part of the reason I'm here because uh, you have the freedom to, to make arguments like that. And what I think is interesting about our political climate is that arguments about restraint are becoming more popular, right? There's a reason for that. The last 17 years have not been great for us. They've been great for Iran, China, and Russia, but they haven't been great for us and our relative power. That's why you read all these articles about the liberal international order going down the toilet bowl.
question. So all of these weapons that are something that came or were built 20 or 30 years ago, the people who built them are already getting old and already getting phased out. So, uh, <laughs> Dude, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pro we have a program for that. <laughs> what um, determines still the uh, viable options? Since we'll have all these things that we didn't build, like we can still analyze them. But if we haven't really tested them, do you think the future generations should take a, st a step forward and, and start testing our own things uh, at our own our own? Our own experiments, not just relying on simulation, or would that be too too dangerous for for So, so there, there's a twofold um, aspect of that, right? If we start testing again, that sends a signal to the rest of the world that we may not want to send. Um, but, but for the last twenty five years, twenty six years now. 1992, last nuclear test, um, which really ticks me off because I didn't go to the one that I actually was doing work associated with. I figured I'd catch the next one. <laughs> that was a bad choice. <laughs> but but, but um, what we have been able to do, this goes to this whole notion of the philosophy of science and all. Doing a nuclear test, depending on what you, what you did, the data was really very limited. Um, we would do better today as, as a scientist. Every year, our director has to sign a letter, and I end up drafting a lot of this part for him. Do we need a nuclear test? We have debated whether we need the nuclear test for the people. But it's very clear at this point, in order to certify the stockpile, the scientific data that we're getting is more valuable than the data we would get from a nuclear test for the same expenditure of money. So it's just an economic thing even right now. Right now, these folks are very pleased because I don't have to walk up and say, my god, we need a nuclear test. In order to get there, though, we've actually created a fairly robust set of experiments and experimental programs. So there are a lot of parts of the weapon that we can actually go and do tests and challenge people, and they can own that. And I would say, as long as we don't have nuclear testing, we will be confined to the principles of operation of a nuclear weapon that we already had. There are other principles. There are ways to make nuclear weapons that are different than what we've got in the stockpile and that we did do experiments on and test. But there's few enough that you would never actually try to deploy a weapon that way. But there's a lot of room for design work and and validating experiments within the box that we have for the class of weapons we have. There is just one really important thing to add on that, though. Remember, by observing the moratorium and by managing, with the exception of North Korea, to preserve, relatively speaking, a pretty solid moratorium, we froze our advantage in place. So, yes, there are things we could do, but there's other countries that I think are frozen in, you know, other places behind us. So there's lots of countries that would love to test. You know, Pakistan wants to test more. India would probably be happy to test. Um, so I think that, you know, we have more advantage. I think other countries have way more to gain by, we don't get to just, you know, preserve it for us and then, you know, we get to start retesting and no one else does. I think other countries have a lot more to gain by a resumption of testing than we do. So, so let me debate that for a second because I'm not certain that I actually agree with that. That's the assertion. Um, that's been a huge part of why we were willing to abide by the moratorium regardless of ratification of the CTPT. And it was certainly true for the first 15 to 20 years of the stewardship era. But, but today, you know, as I described, how do we do it? We build big lasers. We have accelerators. We build um, hydrodynamic exper experiments. Um, secrets leak. Secrets go across the, the world. The weapons aren't changing. So eventually, any leak in that balances a, lo a lot. And the way that we're doing our stewardship today driven by high-performance computing,
driven by large lasers like NIF, we are watching a country like China build computers that are bigger than ours, build lasers that are as powerful or more powerful than ours. When we were in that more primitive state where we really had to rely on the nuclear tests to tie those couple pieces of scientific understanding we didn't have, the science is the science. And in the end, the science will grow out from under those nuclear tests. And then the question of can I adopt the different principle of operation and the different countries did adopt different principles of operations in their nuclear weapons. Um, that, that field will not, we did not, we will find 15 years from now that we did not freeze our advantage in place. Okay, Te technologically, we will find that. Yeah, but it's a shrinking advantage. It is a shrinking advantage. As, they, as other countries we, work around it. We have one today, but it's, it's going away. We have time for one more question. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Adams, um, question about the uh, tactical nukes made me think. Um, when we talk about China's nukes, Russia's nukes, North Korea's nukes, um, we often think of as the head of state who has the finger on the problem. Are there countries or instances where it would not be the head of states um, saying, shoot, shoot off this nuke? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, one. The scenario that worries me a lot, and, and one reason I was was and still I'm worried about the South Asian context is that countries' nuclear strategies matter and how they uh, operationalize their nuclear forces matter. So Pakistan, for instance, is known to so-called pre-delegate launch authority. That means if there's a crisis and shooting starts with India, uh, local commanders in the field are going to have launch authority over nuclear weapons. So the, the, the head of government will have pre-delegated uh, the launch authority in those cases. Now, why would you do that? You might think that sounds crazy. You do that in part to bolster deterrence. Pakistan is inferior to India conventionally, and so it believes it needs to use its nuclear forces quickly in order to deter a conventional invasion. And in order to make that threat credible, it pre-delegates pre launch authority. Uh, so that's a scenario where you, you can easily imagine uh, nuclear weapons being used without the Pakistani head of government necessarily being thrilled about it or, or even directly authorizing uh, such an attack. And, and, you know, we might worry about something similar happening in other countries as well. With that, I think we have to wrap up. Please join me in thanking this outstanding panel.